to make things that make things better, have fun doing it, and learn to help yourself and everyone around you flourish? Well, you've come to the right place. Welcome to Enliven. This is the show where we explore what's possible and the people, the principles, and the practices that are going to help you build enlivening products and enlivening organizations. I'm your host, Andrew Scottsko, and my guest in this episode is Holly Hester Riley. Holly Hester Riley is the founder and CEO of H2R Product Science, where she combines more than a decade of experience in technology with years of experience in scientific research to bring her clients a rigorous research and evidence-driven approach to developing a growth strategy and coaching their product teams. Now, Holly has helped startups, high growth companies, and enterprises around the world like MediaMath, Shutterstock, the Lean Startup Company, Unilever, Weight Watchers, and many, many more figure out basically which product growth opportunities should they pursue and to actually develop and build the product management skills within their organization to deliver on their goals. She teaches and speaks globally about building high growth products and effective learning organizations. She's done that at events such as the Lean Startup Berlin, growth equity firm General Atlantic's CIO Summit the employee summit for top design and development agency ThoughtBot at Product Tank New York, the New School and the Product School, among many, many others. You should also know that before she worked in tech, Holly was a research scientist and a chemical engineer, and she holds multiple degrees from Columbia University in New York, where she's based now. Now, if you've been following the leading edge of practice in product management and organizational design over the last few years, you've undoubtedly seen lots of conversations about shifting to high impact and rapid experimentation, innovation, and customer centricity. Now, that is what we go deep on here. In this conversation, we discuss what continuous product discovery is, a step-by-step path to transition to it. We talk about how teams and organizations can create much tighter feedback loops of ongoing research with their customers. We talk about the mindset shifts to get comfortable with failure, how to translate many of the best practices from cutting edge technology companies outside the tech space, for example, into nonprofit work or into non-tech companies, and how to create buy-in for new ways of working, among many other things. Holly is a true systems thinker and experimenter, and in this conversation, she lays down a masterclass addressing some of the biggest challenges that I and many entrepreneurial people in many organizations face, like how do we build a team and an organization that's deeply connected to the people we seek to serve on an ongoing basis. In product management parlance, this is called continuous discovery or dual track product discovery. Now, even if you don't work in a tech company or you don't work in product management, I promise you there is a lot of actionable and principled wisdom here that I believe is going to make an immediate and lasting impact on how you and your organization make the contribution you seek to make. On top of that, Holly is just a ton of fun to jam with. So with no further delay, please enjoy this conversation with Holly Hester Riley. Officially, Holly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here and share this conversation with me, especially during uh, the middle of the COVID quarantine, as I'm liking to call it. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, this is going to be really fun. And, and as I was saying before we hit record, um, I've become a big fan of your work and in particular your podcast, which we'll, I'm sure we'll jam about a little bit later in the conversation over the last six months. Uh, so it's, it's such a treat for me to get to have you uh, come on the show. So really thrilled to have you here. One thing I, I always like to start a little bit more on the personal side, and I came across that you used to be a competitive figure skater, and I was hoping you could tell <laughs> yes. me, like, is that is that something you still do, or like, how does that does that play a role in your life still? Tell me about uh, that. Yes, it does. Oh my god, um, good good research, <laughs> good job, Andrew. Um, so yeah, I grew up uh, in Massachusetts, um, and. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was a younger kid, I had done like gymnastics and dance, and then um, Christy Yamaguchi won the Olympics. Um, and I just watched that and I was like, oh my God, that looks like the most amazing sport ever. Like, mom, please take me to the rink. I want to go skating. Christy Yamaguchi wins the Olympics. You know, she like goes to Disneyland and tries to like eat her medal, you know, like this thing that it's <laughs> what figure skaters do. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, take me to the rink. I want to try it. And I was, um, I was nine at the time, which is actually, um, they would, they would call that old to start competitive figure skating. But because I had been a gymnast before, um, you know, I was, I had been stretching and practicing all sorts of limber things and, and athletic things. And so, um, so I was able to transition pretty easily. And by the time I was like 10, like within a year later, I had quit every other sport and was just like only figure skating that's my thing and i was skating like five days a week um by the time i was like 10 and um you know like fast forward um by the time i got to eighth grade i actually changed schools so that i could um be close to the rink i was training at and i trained at this rink at the time in marlboro massachusetts where we had a bunch of olympians so like i grew up with olympians around me every day. Um, so we had uh, Ilya Kulik, who was the first man to land a quadruple jump in the Olympics from Russia, because there was this Russian coach, Tatiana Tarasova. 
Um, so she you, had, without, without, you were just in like the little American mecca of figure skating, basically, I, I is what mean, it sounds like. like. Well, there's several of them, but I was in one of them. I mean, like Massachusetts at the time, like Nancy Kerrigan lived in Massachusetts and there were these coaches on the Cape um, that, you know, coached these other Olympians. There were many like Olympians who had grown up in Massachusetts. And so it was like one of the places where, you know, becoming a world level figure skater seemed like a totally like not hmm. totally normal but like something that you see people around you doing and you're like oh i could do that and yeah. then there's lots of rinks to practice at there's lots of you know um local rinks and then they feed into the regional rinks and then then they feed into like national training centers and um and it was at the peak of the sport so most of my time training um michelle kwan was just like the dominant force and i <clears throat> excuse me i loved michelle kwan she was my favorite mm -hmm. because not only was she a beautiful skater but she also was a really great sport and in the sport of figure skating they teach you a lot about or they or they judge you a lot <laughs> on <laughs> whether you are um, a good sport whether you present yourself properly off the ice mm -hmm. and whether you're something okay. that they would want to represent the country um, uh, wow. yeah, oh yeah i didn't know I so there's, a, there's as much focus on like what you do off the ice as there is what you do on the ice mm-hmm yeah. So what I would say is like, if you haven't seen I, Tanya, and you're curious about what figure skating is really like, go see I, Tanya. It's real. It's the most okay. real portrayal of the figure skating world I've ever seen. And, um, and it's a, it's a, it's a dark movie. <laughs> <laughs> like it's dark but it's real <laughs> yeah um so this was this was like i mean transformative for me and i to be honest to this day it's a part of who i am and it and um you know i went through my own sort of love affair and then and then betrayal from the sport and um mm. didn't do it for a while and then you know as an adult came back to it and figured out how i um how i could just enjoy it just enjoy mm. what i can do and not and accept what i can't do and be fine with that and now i have this great relationship with it where I use it for athletic, you know, I just use it for exercise and um, I love to go to the rink and feel the way the ice feels on my feet. It feels like going home. And it's one of the things uh -huh. that I miss. Like I was skating this winter. I, I love when winter comes because I can go skate outside in New York City where there's so many beautiful outdoor rinks and, and now COVID. So... I think a lot of people have probably had this experience where, you know, we've watched skaters on TV and you're like, wow, it looks so, they make, like, they make it look so graceful and so easy, mm -hmm. but I know it's anything but. And I'm curious, <laughs> what does it actually feel like to do, like, a, I don't know, I don't know if a triple axle or what, I don't I feel yeah. like, you know, move that I know, but to do a mm -hmm. jump and spin, like, like, what does that actually feel like? And what does it take to do that? Oh my God. It takes falling all the time. Like, honestly, okay. this is one of the things like when I was like, I have all these lessons from skating that I do apply to, you know, my day to day life these days. And, and one of them is like, I literally, I'm not afraid of failure because I had to fall like a hundred times a day every day for, and I was competitive for about seven years. I retired at, um, just before I turned 17 and a um, lot of falls, a lot of falls. <laughs> Like 10,000 falls. You know what I mean? Yeah, like <laughs> thousands and thousands of falls. <laughs> exactly. Lots of falls. On cold, um, hard ice. <laughs> yeah. Like at one point I chipped my tailbone and then I like could barely walk. Like definitely. Ow. Yeah. Lots of, you know, lots of bruises, lots of like falling in cold puddles and then being like, well, we're still here. We got to keep going. Like yeah. <laughs> going through it. Um, and so it takes, it just takes like tons and tons of practice, but then it also takes like, I mean, it takes the dedication, which for those of us who are in the middle of it, like we kind of all take it for granted, I think that like, of course, we're all dedicated. We're here every day and like we're doing this. But once you kind of step outside and like leave the skating world, you watch what other people do and you're like, oh, OK, I see why they said I was dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, wait, I, other people don't get up at 5 a.m. on Saturday to go skate? What the hell? Yeah, exactly. They're not all at the rink by um, like 7.30 a.m. for a ballet class and then, uh, you know, get on the ice and spend their morning like falling on their butt in the cold. <laughs> 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 That's not what they do. Oh, <laughs> there's so many things I've taken from it. And um, but on the other side, like it feels amazing when you learn a new trick. Um, so you learn a new skill, like you learn how to do a, a different kind of spin or a different kind of jump than you've done before. Um, for me, um, my... Uh, the, the place that I got to was in my final years, I was training with these coaches, um, Mark Mitchell and Peter Johansson, who teach the skating club of Boston. And, and um, Peter was an Olympian and Mark just barely missed the Olympics for the U.S. And um, training with them was just an honor. It was amazing. I'm so grateful that I got to train with them. Um, and when I was working with them, I started landing double axles and um, landed a triple and that's the point at which it starts to actually feel like you're like what you kind of imagine it would be like. Like when you do like a single jump, it doesn't really feel like you're spinning in the air, like because the spin is so short. When you do a double jump, like it feels a little bit like you're spinning in the air, but like 
it's also kind of quick. But once you start doing a double axle and triples, then you're like, yeah, no, I totally just jumped in the air, like spun a bunch of times and landed on like one foot. And I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> it feels like just amazing. You feel like a badass. It's, yeah, it's kind of intoxicating. <laughs> that is amazing. I love that. Are you, um, are you familiar at all with uh, Anders Ericsson? No, I'm not. No. Does the term deliberate practice, are you familiar with that word or that term? I mean, I can imagine, but I don't know that I'm not used to it. So enlighten me. So this is the guy who's considered, I think, pretty much he's like the global expert on expertise. Mm. Um, so he's the person who, like Malcolm Gladwell, made popularize the 10,000 hour rule, right. which has since been like, okay, he, he kind of presented it wrong. But yeah. Anders er- K. Anders Erickson, he's the person whose research Gladwell was referencing. Oh. And so he's the, he's the person who has done, I don't know, decades at this point of research on basically how do humans get great at stuff. Oh, and, awesome. Yeah. So deliberate practice is, is a, a, a term he coined to describe a very particular kind of practice, which is what you just described doing many, many, many hours of, of mm-hmm. you know, you're at your, you're working at your limit. You're at your edge. Oh, and yeah. It's like constant feedback and it's tough and it's gritty. And like a lot of days it sucks and you just have to keep pushing. And it's like, you know, it's so exhausting because you're so at your edge, but mm-hmm. that's actually the pathway towards mastery. Yeah. Um, and so it seems like one of the things that you, acquired or developed rather is probably a more accurate uh, term without maybe realizing you did was the capacity to do that kind of work to do that kind of practice for a long time yeah i i do think i did and it's something i've reflected on you know in the past uh basically since i started training other people in product management um and going and working with people in business because frankly having grown up in that environment it was surprising to me how uncomfortable with failure so many people are and how uncomfortable with like that that uncomfortable place like Mm. it's not i'm not gonna like i I love this barry o'reilly has this phrase about like getting comfortable with being uncomfortable right and like that's the thing like i i i was trained from a young age to believe that if i wasn't uncomfortable while i was practicing something i wasn't growing and that wasn't worth the effort and um you know so that's a powerful place to come from yeah, I did. I'm so grateful, you know, and I mean, I was always grateful. I knew there were a lot of elements of it that I that I was just very privileged to be able to do and have a part in. And um, I just like I can't I can't stress enough how it's affected my mindset and, and the way that I act as a professional, because um, I'm used to being in that uncomfortable edge spot. And that's that's the place where you either fall or you land it. But at least you tried, you know. Yeah. At least you went for yeah it. it's like that that edge. It's like home base for you now. Yeah, exactly. That's that's so cool. I want to shift gears now and start to talk about uh, product and product discovery and a lot of the stuff you're working on. For those who aren't familiar with that term, uh, particularly the, the the framing of it as continuous discovery, how would you explain that to someone who's not familiar with that term? What is that? What does that mean? Yeah, so continuous product discovery. Um, that is basically the practice of continually doing uh, doing some kind of research every single sprint every single week, um, at least more frequently than, you know, just trying to make it as frequent as you can. I think the ultimate goal is that it's every week. Um, if teams aren't there, that's okay. But um, doing it regularly in small batches so that um, you're continually testing, you know, what is it that I should be building and what are the nuances of how I should build it to make sure that it works for our user and our buyer and our customers. Um, and then every time that you have um, important decisions to make, you can turn to the research to answer those decisions in near real time. Um, so basically, um, this is the big difference between doing continuous product discovery and just doing product discovery in batches is that um, you uh, you actually can say to yourself, well, what is the biggest decision I have to make in the next two weeks? That's what I should do my research on in the next two weeks. And that way you don't have to you don't have to guess when if you're doing batch as, as a contrast, if you're doing a batch set of research, like you're doing some big ethnography, um, you know, once a year or maybe even once a quarter um, at the beginning of it, you're guessing what are all the things I think I need to know. And then, um, you know, you get a bunch of helpful stuff and you start making decisions based off of it. But once you're like, say a month, two months down, um, I guarantee you, you're going to come across questions that are decisions you have to make where your ethnography does not give you the answers you needed. Um mm-hmm. And so this is, you know, if you stretch it out and you do it continuously, you'll, you'll have that at your fingertips. 
Yeah. So this, this is one of those things where I became familiar with the term continuous discovery a couple years ago. And it sounds like you and I both had a uh, similar, uh, powerful experience, uh, from a man named Marty Kagan. Mm, and yes. I was curious. <laughs> so, so he's someone who plays a huge role in my own career arc, which I didn't even fully realize until a couple years ago. But what was that experience for you? And, and let's use that as a jumping off point. Oh, man. Well, um, shout out to Marty, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Father of all this stuff. Shout out to Marty. Um, so for me, I, uh, I first was influenced by Marty. Um, and I actually, I would say I didn't even know it at the time, but when I went, um, the first high growth startup I was in is a company called Media Math. It's an ad tech company Mm. here in New York City. And, um, when I got the job at Media Math, uh, I was somewhere around like the fifth product manager there. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it was like 150-ish people when you started, I think? Yeah, exactly. I think I was like number 143. Um, okay. So uh, what I didn't know is that um, a, that they had been influenced heavily by Marty um, going back years. Um, and so uh, I had chosen them um, out of the out of the options I had, be, largely because, and this is going to sound funny at this point in time, but largely because they practiced the Scrum. Um, okay. And at the time, I had read about Agile and Scrum, and I had, for at this point in time, I I had never been in a company larger than ten people um, doing software. Sorry, just really quick for anyone who's not familiar with the term Scrum, what is that? Oh yeah, so Scrum is a, a version of um, Agile software development um, with a particular flavor of it, where you have uh, you, certain rules you follow, like you have a sprint at the beginning of the sprint, you have a sprint planning meeting. Um, at the end of the sprint, you have a a uh, they call it a tip in, in the literature. It's called a sprint review, but most teams just do the sprint demo. Um, and, uh, you have daily standups. Um, and so there's a couple key elements that are involved in this, but basically it's a particular architecture for, um, the design of how you develop software. And, um, and one of the other things you and I haven't mentioned in this call yet is, um, my actual, um, training before I moved into software is as a chemical engineer. Um, and so when I started learning about methodologies for developing software, I always sort of like applied this process development, um, mindset to it and looked at like what makes sense to me. So at the point in time when I got to media math, um, I had read a lot of books from um, Safari, which is uh, the Tim O'Reilly's online, uh, or yeah, the O'Reilly sure. Media online. Um, and so I had read, like I remember the Cathedral and the Bazaar, the Mythical Man Month, um, like Agile software product management, you know, various things like that. So very- the, the foundational kind of classics there. Exactly. Yeah. That's, you know, that's how I got my, you know, my, uh, what I'll call my honorary computer science background. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, um, so I had, I came in with this philosophy that we were supposed to be regular, that the reason why the work was split into sprints was so that we could inspect and adapt and figure out what made the most sense for for customers, not just what made the most sense for engineers. What I didn't know at the time is because I'd been at such small companies where it was really easy for me to influence everything. I didn't know how rare that was, but uh, it actually was really rare. And when I picked uh, Media Math, I picked it because um, they already had moved to Scrum. And the year at this time, I want to say it was 2012. And not, I mean, all the other companies I'd interviewed with that were startups in New York were not doing Scrum. They were doing, quote, Agile, but it was a much more, um, well, they weren't necessarily all doing Agile. They basically didn't have as much structure around their process. So I I share all of that because um, before I even ever met Marty Kagan for the first time, he was already influencing what was going on around me because the company I was at was um, trying to be uh, practicing you know, true agile with, um, with dual track sprints, um, to some degree. Uh, now mm-hmm. I, I will add to some degree because, um, you know, we definitely upped it, but the fact that there was even the appetite there, you know, that there was not a baseline assumption that we should be planning things out annually, um, mm-hmm. is actually something that I think, uh, you know, I think we can attribute back to having been influenced by Marty from the beginning. He had, um, trained, I think the COO at the time and, and such, um, mm, awesome. And the, the, the head of product, a guy named Dave Gavazzi, um, he was the VP of products when I got there. He um, had all of his new product managers go to Marty's training. So within my first year there, I went out to Marty's training and, um, and I was just like, this is fantastic. I, I think one thing I hear a lot is a lot of people go to the training and they're like, oh my God, I've just learned everything I did, I've been doing is wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I went, I had a similar, I talked to a lot of people who were just like, they had their head in their hands and they're like, oh God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't have that. I had more like, here's all the things that I like, 
here's so many more things I could be doing that would be really great. Like, let me also build this. Let me also build that. Let me also build that. Just as a quick aside for anyone who just listened to me say that, that is in no way to say that going to Marty's training is a bad idea. It's amazing. <laughs> and if you ever get the chance to go, you should absolutely go. The oh God thing was just people going realizing there's such a better way available and they have been they weren't aware of it. Yeah. And and to add on to that, um, it's specifically if you already believe in product discovery, but your colleagues don't, or you're constantly fighting other people about it, get them to come with you. Bring mm-hmm. the CTO or the VP of engineering or whatever um, so that they can hear from him directly. It would be it's a really good way to level up your team. Totally. So, okay. So you're at Media Math and you're, you, without realizing it, you've sort of, you, you've, you're swimming in a pool that's already framed into this type of working, right? This is already in the DNA of the organization. Yeah. So, um, Let's for for people who aren't familiar with this and haven't had the the, the privilege to go to something like Marty's training. Um, what does that actually look like? Like if I was you know a fly on the wall mm-hmm. and I'm watching the way you were doing it at Media Math and the way you're doing it now, what would I see that's different than the way let's just say a typical company is approaching doing their product research or product discovery? I mean, I'm going to start with the basics that you see in most most places that are. Pre- trying to practice agile, which is you're, you're going to see the things that I talked about with the scrum, right? You're going to see sprint planning meetings. The thing that to me is a big indicator of whether this company is doing any form of continuous product discovery is, is what's actually happening in those meetings. What's actually happening in the sprint planning? What's actually happening in the retrospective? Hmm. You know, Are they actually practicing a sprint demo and what's happening in the demo or how are they communicating what's been worked on and what's happening, what they're learning? Um, so the thing that is really key is that um, in a company like this, uh, when the development team gets together and meets with the product manager and the, the designer and anybody, you know, they're, if they have a scrum master or a project manager or what have you, release manager, when they get together and meet with those people um, every sprint, they're not just following some plan that's been laid out for months. That's the big difference. They're actually getting together and saying, hey, what is the most effective thing for us to do next? And in the most well-run companies, there is a thing that's been laid out for months, and that's the strategy. The strategy has been laid out. The vision has been laid out. But the specifics of what the software team is going to do are not laid out months in advance. And they're definitely not laid out like six quarter, six, you know, it's not like an annual roadmap, right? With, With actually features on the roadmap. What I mean by that, just to dive a little deeper, is you would get into a meeting and let's say, uh, in my time at Media Math, the first place where we were starting to negotiate what was coming up next was not the sprint planning, but rather the backlog grooming meeting, which comes before sprint planning. So we would go to this meeting, this backlog grooming meeting. I'll, I'll get into a minute. There's actually one step before that we were doing too. But you get into this backlog grooming meeting. And as the product manager, you're at that meeting communicating to the engineers. At this point in time, our best understanding of what's the most important work for us to do next is this set of things. Now let's talk Mm -hmm. about how we can go about breaking that into pieces, writing stories for it, adding acceptance criteria, um, you know, clearing up what it means to do this set of things. Um, And in this meeting, we'll just start to, we'll just make sure that we've got enough of that scoped out that we have, you know, a sprint's worth of work to do from it. And a sprint is typically like two weeks on average? Yes, exactly. So at Media Math, sprints for two weeks. Um, I will say at this point in my life, I definitely do a lot of one-week sprints. I think those are awesome when possible. Um, whether they're possible depends a lot on the organization design and the size of the organization. One of the other things I will add here is like when I was at Media Math and, and at other companies I've been at too, um, we also would have a step either before or after backlog grooming where the product managers were meeting with other product managers. So basically some some point along the way, which often gets missed in larger organizations, where we're actually thinking up and saying, here's the chunk of work I was thinking my team would do in the next sprint or th- that we're going to start breaking apart into pieces. This is what it entails. How does it jive with what you all are working on? Does it step on any toes? Does it break anything? Does it go towards the same strategy? Are we going to align really well? That's something that we would also do every sprint, not like once a quarter. <laughs> and and these are things that I've seen done, you know, once a quarter or or less at some other companies I've worked with since then. And so I, I need to call out that that's a, that's a piece of it too. It sounds like one of the underlying principles in what you're describing so far is this shift from sort of big heavyweight processes that happen once in a while to sort of really lightweight things that are just happening all the time. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think that that is where companies need to go. Um, I think uh, I was blessed at Media Math that it, I never saw the heavyweight process there in the first place. It started to come in later as the company grew and they were trying to figure out how they work as a larger... Once we were up to like 800 people, there started to be more of those. And um, you know that definitely affected the way the company operated. 
But most companies that I work with, it is a shift. It's a shift from that to something else. And that's really scary for especially for the executives and the people who are used to reporting plans. And that's one of the things that I, I think a lot of product people miss when they are trying to push. If you're trying to be the change agent who's like, no, we need to do continuous product discovery. You know, I think Marty says in one of his articles about um, roadmaps uh, that you you like in the alternative to roadmaps, I think is the article. Um we can say that a feature-based roadmap isn't helping the product team and it's getting us into all sorts of trouble, but we also can't just like, just say that and then like drop Mike and leave the room. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like whether you like them or not, they do exist for some reason. So. Right. so you have to go to the underlying reasons and figure out what about that is giving, you know, comfort or stability or, you know, value, real value to the people who are consuming that roadmap, which is typically the executives and the, maybe the board. Um, sometimes the customers or the prospective sales. Um, and how can you still meet those needs without committing to features ahead of time? Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's what we do on my, on the teams I work with now, um, is mm. we, we do that with an outcomes based roadmap, with a clear strategy, with a clear vision, you know, selling the vision, selling the strategy, not selling the features. It seems like because I've been I've been uh, the person in the organization I work with now for a couple of years, sort of being that change agent and, and pushing things and saying, hey, there's a better way we can do this. Like there's nothing necessarily wrong with what we're doing now, but look what else is available. Look how much better we could be doing these things and how much more value we could be creating. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, you know, one of the one of the mistakes I made was thinking that any sort of change like that would um, happen quickly, mm -hmm. which just I could not have been more wrong about that uh, in, in every possible way. Um, and that has been extremely humbling for me. But mm -hmm. one of the things I'm curious about is, is so if anyone, you know, people listening to this, they're going to be walking out of this conversation, uh, walking out of listening to this conversation with a lot of really cool ideas by the time we're done. Mm -hmm. And in terms of how they go about implementing them, how would you recommend they like frame that for themselves mentally and psychologically like are there levels to this like where do they start and you know because I, I yeah. think it's easy to see you see the, the city on the hill and you're like oh great we'll just go there and then it doesn't work so how do how do we actually like step our way there what, what does that look like yeah oh, that's an act an awesome question um so i do actually see there as being levels to this because i've been teaching people how to transition to con to continuous product discovery for so long that i've now kind of got like a i've realized patterns and what i recommend they do next um, let me start with um, starting small is always good um, because it is going to take a long time. It's not going to be a fast change. Even if you are lucky enough to convince high level people that you need to make these changes, which often is one of the hard parts, you still need to account for the fact that everybody within the organization who's going to learn to work this way needs time to adjust to the changes. You know, it's, it's never going to be fast. Um, it's definitely going to be on the order of months at the shortest. And in many cases, it's going to be a process of, of continuously getting better at this and, and not feeling like it's really optimized for more, more, much more than that even. So as far as steps, um, I actually have put a lot of thought into this and I've developed something I call the product science success path. So I have, um, laid out five steps where the first step is um, basically a team that's doing agile product development. They're delivering software in a at least somewhat continuous fashion. You know, the most ideal version is that they're actually pushing code multiple times a day to production and they're using, you know, feature flags and all these things. But even if they're just pushing it every sprint, at least that that's step one. Um, so if, okay, if so agile is sort of table stakes here, exactly. <laughs> like if you're not even practicing, like if your team cannot deliver software at least once a sprint, then you've got to fix that first. Um, you can work Great. on doing continuous discovery, but like you're going to, it's not going to have a lot of impact because your team is delivering software. So rarely they can't pivot very well. So that's like table stakes. Once you've got that, then the next step up is doing some form of continuous research, but it might not yet be regularly impacting the work that you do. Like a lot of times teams will start with like, Let's just get faster and more frequent at how often we talk to customers or how often we look at data. And one of the things that we often see at this stage is that teams that do one or the other, but not both. So um, mm. a really important thing to keep in mind is that continuous product discovery is both quantitative and qualitative. Um, okay. It is not only one or the other. There's a, a great webinar that you all did recently that we'll link to in the show notes about how to basically how to do this kind of continuous rapid research and discovery, especially in uncertain weird times like we're in right now during the COVID quarantines globally. And I think the way you explained it in there uh, was that one way of thinking about like the difference between qualitative and quantitative was that qualitative was it sort of it, it's it's it answers why things happen and how they happen. Whereas quantitative is a way of answering questions of like how much is happening and how many are of a thing are happening. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
what I, one thing I want to take a step back and say is that um, in terms of moving from one thing to the next, I kind of jumped over a step, which is there are some teams that do agile product development and don't even do um, staged batched discovery. Like, you know, I don't know if, hmm. if you've talked to teams like this, but um, basically the way I would describe that is like a team that's doing agile product development and maybe like strategy is set somewhere else in the company entirely. And mm. like the research yep. that like the product manager isn't actually talking to customers. So um, I do have a step in between there, which um, I basically call like a basic level of product discovery practitioners. And okay. at, at that step um, they're doing that discovery at least, but it might be, but it's probably in a batch and not continuous. Got it. So it seems like the shift there is so, so table stakes is, is you got to be doing some form of agile and being able to release release product on an ongoing basis without without the sort of big bang release. And it seems yeah. like then there's another another kind of, uh, you know, table stakes factor here, which is that if your product teams are really just sort of I think the the somewhat um, pejorative term for it is like a feature factory where right. you're, someone else has done all the thinking and you're just delivering. Right. Uh, then, then that is, it seems like it's the next table stakes shift. Is that, am I getting that right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and basically if you're, if you're currently a uh, feature factory, as you just put it, um, and you're not doing any of the thinking yourself, then you're going to find it really hard to try to go straight from that to continuous, both qualitative and quantitative. Um, it's a big step just to learn how to talk to customers and how to interpret the research. We, when we work with teams, we, um, we do take it easy. Like, right. Like, and I don't mean like slacking off. I just mean, you know, one step at a time. First, first, mm -hmm. we've got to make sure you know how to do some research. And then after mm -hmm. we've got you doing research, we can talk about how we make it filter into the work you're doing regularly. Um, and, and one of the reasons why we do that is, uh, I'll tell you, I have worked with teams that are feature factories and are trying, and they've got a product manager who's trying to transition to continuous discovery. And a lot of times, um, there's this huge learning curve for the engineers to come to this realization that their job isn't only to deliver the features that have been asked of them. Yep. Yeah. It's a tough one. Tell me a story about how, about when you've seen an engineer go through that transition. Like what, what got that engineer over the hurdle? What, what made it click? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the most common way that I've seen this actually click is, is to be honest at a company that's in trouble. So when the company isn't um, just, you know, everything's growing and, and we're all excited, but instead um, maybe the product itself, the performance is in trouble in terms of what impact it drives to the business. And the reason why that's the most common place for me to see this is because that's the place where the engineer actually starts to fear for their job. Um, mm. and if the engineers are seeing that, Hey, if we don't make this have a bigger impact on the business, then we're not going to be able to work on this product anymore. Um, that's when they start to, to realize that they do actually care what they're building. So most often I've seen that on, you know, something where it's like, maybe it's either a startup within an enterprise or it's, um, a new product, te a team that's launching a new product. And so that team is in the, the riskier stage of like, is this product going to survive? And they're either worried about their actual job or they're worried about having to go back to the main product, which isn't as exciting for them as the new one. I would say I've also seen it happen, but it's harder in like, um, dying industries. <laughs> um, so like media, you know, um, it's like newspapers. Yeah, exactly. You know, being a part of that, being a part of, um, something that's been, hasn't yet really been disrupted by, um, modern tech, um, but where they do see that that is, um, coming. And the way that I've seen that transformation happen is basically, uh, in courses that I've taught, I actually, uh, you know, you mentioned at some point something about, well, the way we're doing it now isn't necessarily, you know, bad or wrong, but there's a better way. Um, I, after many, many experiences not convincing people, um, got to a place where I no longer will say that. I will say, nope, this is wrong. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Maybe I'm going to do it your way now. If this, is, if this works better, I'm stealing your playbook. I mean, it's, it's emotionally difficult for everybody. But I will tell them failure stories um, because I've seen them. I've lived through them. And if they're not scared, it's probably because they haven't yet. Um, and the whole point of me being there to train is to bring the painful experiences that I've had to the classroom so that the other people can learn before going through them all themselves. Sure. So typically the next most successful way for me to convince an engineer who's like, no, I really just want to ship features. I just want to ship code. Can you just measure me on the number of commits I make? Yeah. Just let me, just let me, leave me alone. Let me just put my headphones on and code. Exactly. Um, is for me to really empathize with them to start to say, look, I went to engineering school too. I, I like to sit with a, a spreadsheet or, you know, like a, a doc and just work on it and not be interrupted and, and not have to think about the other things. But at the end of the day, 
the reason I'm doing that is to make an impact on the company. And here's some stories I have from my past about times when that was missed and, and the whole company died. Um, so my really big story around that is that I was actually in Toys R Us, Babies R Us consulting okay. um, for a couple of months around when they filed for bankruptcy. So before they filed, oh, wow. they were looking, you know, like inside the company, we all knew the numbers. We saw what was happening um, year over year. We were looking at e-commerce versus, you know, brick and mortar sales and Amazon was just eating their lunch entirely. Yep. So there, so there was definitely an incentive to change. Like people were feeling the pain. Right. People were feeling the pain. Um, but even with that, there were a lot of engineers there. They had only just moved to Agile. I started working with them in January of 2017, and they had just moved to Agile like the fall before. And I say moved to Agile like generously. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had an intention to move to Agile. Right. Or they thought they had moved to Agile. But the, 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 thing, the, big, the big thing that I, that I mean is um, there's a lot of companies out there that just break the work into chunks, but they're still planning a year in advance. And that's not true Agile. Um, so uh, can we just also call out if anyone here is working in an enterprise that uh, guy, what's it called a safe, the scaled agile framework. That's bullshit. That is not actually agile and you should go running for the hills or screaming or something. Yeah, totally. No, if you're in that situation, you should start doing some research on how either how to convince people or what's going to happen if it all doesn't work out. And maybe start dusting off your resume. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sadly. It, right. But it's true. I, I wish that wasn't true, but Yeah. Okay, so Toys R Us, they had an intention to move to Agile. Everyone sees the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? Yeah, so at the time that I started working with them, they had brought in a bunch of people who knew product discovery. They had someone from Amazon, someone from Google, someone from Netflix. Like they literally brought in some big guns in the product world. And, okay. you know, we're looking to add the dual track Agile, um, you know, meaning doing product discovery and product delivery at the same time um, to mm -hmm. the way they worked. But um, what I saw was that uh, it takes a lot longer you know, to actually get that in place than the amount of time they had left before they were going to die. One of the challenges was that the um, the engineering teams were were used to not having to question what they'd been told to do and just being left to work on it for multiple quarters. And they didn't want to change because it was very stressful for them. Um, you know, it's very stressful for somebody to be saying, well, actually, we're going to need to really work as a team and inspect every sprint, whether the things we're working on next are the most useful things. They thought they were doing that because they were doing sprint planning. They were doing, um, you know, backlog grooming, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing is that they were also lacking an overall strategy that it was all tying under. That would be what ties it together beyond just, we think we should make our software more modern. And so uh, I was trying to convince the people I was working with there that, you know, we had to do this continuous process. We had um, that we would we would need to be doing research to understand what the strategy should be. And we would need to be ready to um, sort of pivot as we came in with results on that because we didn't have a strategy yet. We would do research at the same time for both the strategy and the tactical, which is something I've done with several teams, but it only been successful at with really high performing teams because it's it's there's so much ambiguity. Most teams are not comfortable with that much ambiguity. By the time I was done with my contract there, I could, I basically totally saw the writing on the wall because I said, they're not able to make this transition. They're not able to work this way. They're all too uncomfortable. They're pushing back. They just want to, you know, do what, they just want someone to tell them what to do and to do it. And mm -hmm. gonna, this isn't going to save the ship. Yep. Yeah, I think it's ironic that the, the scaled agile framework is is uh, the acronym is used for it is safe because it's like it's like a it's like a binky, right? It's like yeah. an executive binky in the enterprise. It's, they, they they feel it makes them feel safe because they're like, look, we did something agile. But if you actually look at it, in no way, shape, or form is it actually adhering to the principles of the agile manifesto. It's right. it's just it's it's just a I don't know a mirage maybe. Yeah, a very complicated one. Like yeah, I don't even get it. Yeah, I, I just, mean, like I've looked at it enough to be like, no, nope, this no. Yeah. Yeah. The last time I was somewhere, I was actually at a growth startup that was, that had sent people to training for that. Um, cause they thought that they would help them with how they scale. And I was like, Oh, pit in my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh, this is going to suck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, Oh no. But so I've literally told that story to other people and that also helps them you know, because then I was like, look, the company did close and everybody got laid off. I think you're right in the sense that any sort of, you know, two of the, two of the main, uh, 
pillars that, that we explore in the show, right? Our, our product development or, and service development, but just like the, the development of what we put in the world to make a difference. And then the organizational design, like how do we build an organization that is extraordinary and et cetera. Uh, and one of the things that's become really obvious is that uh, it's ideal if you're, if you want to make a change in an organization that there is some like motivating factor, right? There's yeah. usually some pain, frankly, to be really blunt about it yep. um, is usually what it takes. And so one of the things I've struggled with at times with some of my own work and, and you know, other people I talk to is they're like, yeah, but we're comfortable, right? Like there's right. nothing really wrong. So there isn't that incentive to change. And it's, it's actually much harder in that case to change. Yeah. One of the ways that I've found to be effective, and this is like, like blocking and tackling line level work, like this is not dealing with the executives. This is like you're one-on-one -on -one with someone on the engineering team. And they're like, but why? I have found in with many of the engineers I've worked with that one way to do it is like, even if they love that at the end of the day, they still, the thing they hate is inefficiency. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, think about this. You could spend all that time like working really hard. You can come up with like the best engineered thing ever, but it's wrong. It's, it's not that, not that you built it wrong. It's that we built the wrong thing. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, and, and that idea that like they would have engineers hate inefficiency. And that is like the most personal form of professional inefficiency for an engineer. Yeah. So that's one, one button you can put anyone listening to this can push that I have found to be fairly effective, uh, even with people who have done it a certain way for well over a decade. So that's yeah. maybe one other place to look. Yeah, I totally agree. And another thing I can say there is you might even ask them, when was the last time you built the wrong thing? Because <laughs> if, they've, yeah. if they've been in an enterprise for a while, I guarantee you they have. <laughs> yep. Yeah, for sure. And you can tell, like, if you've been, I have, I have plenty of personal stories of, you know, we thought we had it right. Mm -hmm. And, oh God, we were so wrong. <laughs> and then we all wasted months. Yeah. And that, that is not a, not a pleasant experience. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's 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 zoom back out here to the the path you were laying out. So we had two table stakes things. We had agile, like real agile, and we had um, that a team is able to do any sort of continuous uh, discovery process and do their own thinking as well as their own delivering. Uh, and then what was the step after that? So um, so actually, I uh, I broke that into the agile and then the some kind of process of discovery and then the continuous making it continuous. So making it to oh, okay, the third it. one. Um, okay. And I call that the continuous product improvers uh, stage. Okay. After that, the next level is what I call um, high impact. Uh, so the high impact experimenters at that stage, not only are they doing continuous product discovery, but they're actually um, finding that they understand they've, they've gotten good enough at this. And this is something that like, it's very, you, you kind of need to do it for a while to get to the place where this, where you're, you need to deliberately practice it to get to the place where not only are you doing research, but you're actually coming up with, with accurate um, conclusions from that research. So the way that I say, you know, how do you know if you're at this stage is if you commonly find that once you release software to your users, your data shows that they use it in the ways that your discovery research suggested they would. The usage example is confirming your hypothesis, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So a really great example of, you know, being at this place where the experimentation is high impact is that when I was working at Shutterstock, um, and we were launching a new product called Shutterstock Editor. We had spent several months of, of agile development and continuous discovery and delivery where we were talking to customers every sprint as well as delivering work every sprint, which was all behind a feature flag for only beta users. Okay. And when we got the first, the first major milestone, which we said, this is the place at which um, we feel comfortable doing some marketing around this. We made it the open beta. So the point at which anybody could join without having to be specially invited. We had made it as small as we possibly could. Um, so it was only for social media managers and marketing managers who were posting to social media that just needed to easily crop images. Now, this might sound really basic, but actually it's um, it was a real pain point because most of these people were opening up Photoshop, which as if any of you have ever opened up Photoshop, you know, can actually take like several minutes <laughs> and navigating, you know, the difficult interface just to crop an image to be the right size for a social media posting. So our first launch was just... Uh, cropping and filtering so that you could post to social media. But we knew that people were going to want text to be able to put on top of it. And we launched without that. And um, because we knew enough people would get value from it, that it would be worth launching. And when we launched, the number one most requested feature was to add text. Um, and this was actually an instance of, okay, I know that my experimentation was working because we knew what to expect. We knew nothing surprised us about that launch, um, you know, for the actual product development team. It was, this is what we knew was going to happen. The amount of people we thought were going to use it, used it. They loved it. The people, they had this particular profile and the people who weren't, um, getting enough value from it to use it yet were asking for the thing that we were working on already. 
Um, and so that, you know, was like, great. At this point in time, you've got really well-functioning continuous discovery and delivery on this one um, this one product. Um, and the, the, there were a couple of teams involved in making that product, but that, that set of teams. There is one more step to um, what I call the product science success path. And that last step is actually where you go from being high impact experimenters to being high growth product leaders. And mm. the key difference there is that now um, not only are your, um, are, is your team knowing what is likely to happen with this release with it when you launch software and, and what's going on, but you've got the confidence and the trust of the stakeholders around you and you're actually spreading out that way of working to teams around you. So you might be a nucleus in your organization of change. You might be the team that's doing continuous discovery and some other teams that are sort of getting going at it and then the other teams that aren't trying it yet. Um, but you are doing it publicly for the company and you're doing it in a, let's call it a politically savvy way that okay. um, that makes people around you feel comfortable and be inspired rather than just want to fight. All right. So we've got the sort of five step path here, which I, I love that you laid that out because it, it, I think it really can help the person, you know, the listener can really find themselves at wherever they are on that path and say, okay, I just got to focus on getting to the next step. Mm -hmm. right? I don't have to worry about getting to perfect, but just what's the next step, um, which I think is such a useful way because this making a transition like this it sounds so simple, but it's huge. And it's, it's like deceptive. It's deceptive in its complexity. And it's, it's really, it's not just a change. It's like an actual full blown transformation in how you think about and do your work. Yeah. Um, so there's so much depth in here. And I want to, I want to, um, I want to zoom in really quick on the shifting to a more agile kind of way of working, right? So mm -hmm. like moving into a, uh, that step of moving into kind of continuous research and delivery where, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, at least people are, let's say they're on board with agile. They thought, yep, cool. That makes sense. Let's do that. And they are, you have the, whatever the authority or the setup or whatever you want to call it to be able to do your own thinking and discovery. And you're not totally beholden to someone else, you know, some strategy doc that was written by someone <laughs> somewhere right. far away. Right. Right. So you have that ability or how do you apply this in a scenario where the work being done is really like what the problem you're trying to solve is really nebulous mm -hmm. and seems like a long range thing. So let me give you a concrete example. The last major product I worked on that uh, I've, I've just recently transitioned off of, there's a lot of problems because we were at the edge of this that nobody had solved. And I, by nobody, I mean like it wasn't even the academic literature. Like no one, as far as we knew in the world, knew how to solve these problems. And so mm -hmm. some of the team, the people on the, the more of the data science and machine learning team or side of the product, they were they felt like they were needing long cycles because mm -hmm. they're like, look, you gave us this problem to solve. We don't know how to solve it. No one knows how to solve it. So we're like basically in the lab trying to figure out how to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And their their sort of counter argument was like, I can't tell you that this is going to be done in a sprint or right. like I can't I can't give you any certainty about when this is done. And so I'm curious, how do we bring because um, machine learning and problems like this are going to become more and more a part of your average product in the Absolutely. world over time. How do we bring this idea of continuous discovery into a space like that, that has a lot more of this almost R&D type flavor to it? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. That's a really good question. So I think there's a, there's a couple of sort of nuances to what you're describing. Um, also, as you described that to me, I'm really curious, did this work? Yeah, it works. Awesome. That's fantastic. It sounds it like... It works. A... We, launched, we launched it last year. Uh, it is... So... I, I can tell you more about it offline, but yeah, right. it, it's, it works. It's live. It's in the world. Brutally hard, but it, but we, we, we got it to work. Well, congratulations. That sounds like something against a lot of odds. So that's really awesome. I, I sometimes I'm still surprised. <laughs> um, so, so the way, so anytime we're working with something that's more nebulous where, you know, you go to the engineers and you're like, we'd like to do this. And they're like, I have no idea whether that can be done or how long it will take. Um, then our job as the product person is to uh, do a couple of things. So the first thing is to understand why, like, why are they not sure? What are the details around this that, you know, they don't have clarity on? Um, what parts of this are making them unsure? Um, and the way that I usually go about that is to do a, a pre-mortem analysis, a pre-mortem risk analysis, where we're asking them okay. to tell us where we say, let's jump forward a year and say that this initiative has failed. Um, now, what are the reasons it's failed? Um, and so particularly when it's something where the engineers are saying, I can't give you an answer for this, you're asking them to tell you, you're giving them a safe space to re give you all the reasons why they think that this is impossible or very, very hard to do. And you want them to be specific about it because you need to collaborate with them on 
which of those things are actually critical to the success of your product. Because there may be things in there that aren't. And your job is to be helping them to find the problem in a, as crisp of a way as you can. So, okay. so you need to get a sense of, of that. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing is to actually see if there's any more defining of the problem that you can do. So can you make the problem broken into smaller chunks? Is there any piece of this that could be usable to somebody sooner um, than other pieces? So for example, like with Shutterstock Editor, um, people were... Many people that we spoke to would have said, I, this isn't valuable for me yet, but there was some group of people for which it was valuable. So let's do that piece first. The third thing is to recognize which of the decisions you and the team are going to make are two-way doors versus one-way doors. Um, mm. And so that's... I love that. Can, can you explain what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is actually a, a terminology that I got from like Jeff Bezos' shareholder letter. Um, so that's where a lot of people hear about this. But the idea is... Um, can you go back on that decision and how expensive is it to do so? So if you make this decision now and then you work for two more months on this um, and then you realize that it was the wrong decision because you've got more research, is it something that's easy for you to change or is it something that now you've got two months of ripping something out and another two months to lay the new foundation? So sort of what's the cost of being wrong, basically? Exactly. Yeah. What is the cost of being wrong about this decision? The higher the cost of being wrong, the more important it is that you do research and discovery to come up with the answer for that decision. So typically the way that I'll work on something like this with a team when we're doing continuous discovery um, is we'll work with the engineers to lay out, to say we've got some big nebulous problem of the things they have to work on, which ones of them are two-way doors, which ones are one-way doors, how, how high is the cost of change if that decision was wrong? And then typically we'll find some kind of piece of what they have to do that we either know that they're... Um, is a two-way door and um, is a foundational thing that has to be built anyways. And we'll be like, okay, you get started on that piece while we do some more of the background research for the one-way doors. Or uh, if there isn't something like that, then typically it's because the thing is so cutting edge, as you were describing, that there's something that the engineers just need time to work on. And if that's the case, then we'll say, okay, you know, still within the context of that, what are the pieces of this that, you know, what does that look like? Like, what does that what does their learning plan look like for trying to find an answer to this and other parts along the way where we can be helpful with product definition or, or problem definition or, um, you know, scope and how can we lay that out so that we can be bringing info back to you. Got it. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. I, I love that pre-mortem idea. Um, that's a really interesting w uh, way to do it. So uh, one of the things I'm curious about, I, I in prepping for this, I heard you, um, I listened to something else you where you talked about high impact experimentation. Mm -hmm. And I think the way you framed it there was that what makes experimentation high impact is prioritizing the riskiest things first. And yep. or the biggest question, you know, like basically what could kill this and let's go yeah. after that first. Yep. Um, so how do you, how does that integrate with what you just said about like the, the two way doors, the one way doors? Yeah. So there's a, there's, I guess one thing I should be super clear about is that there's, what are we prioritizing for research and what are we prioritizing for the engineers to be working on? And so often those are at odds. So we're prioritizing okay. for research, the riskiest things, but then we're saying the engineers are going to work on the least risky things while we get the research in place before they do the risky things. Does that make sense? Okay. I think what you're saying is in the, so, so zooming out to frame this for, for myself and the listener, we're operating in a dual track model. What that means is track one is we've got continuously discovering, continuous discovery, right? So we're continuously researching, discovering what do we need to build and, and what's the right thing to make. And then the other track in parallel is continuously delivering whatever we've validated is worth building. Right. And so with that context, you're saying, I think, that in the discovery track, we should be prioritizing the riskiest things first and say, okay, this could kill it. We got to go figure this out first. Mm -hmm. And then in the delivery track, we should be uh, prioritizing the things that are the least risky. Is that what you're saying? So that is what I said, but it's, it's not... Let me sort of refine that. In the situation when you're at the beginning of a very nebulous project with a bunch of unknowns, okay, then you... Um, need you absolutely need to have the researchers prioritizing the riskiest thing first. What the engineers prioritize depends on whether the risk is feasibility risk or a different kind of risk. So mm. if it's a feasibility risk, which means that the engineers are not sure if they could possibly build this ever, then they need to prioritize that because they're the only ones who can answer that. 
Um, and is that in the discovery track or the delivery track? So that's a great question. Kind of, I, kind of both maybe? yeah, it's kind of both at that point. So if you have major feasibility risks, like you are doing something cutting edge, as you were describing in your case, and you do not know whether it's possible for your engineers to do it or not, then they do need to prioritize that because you better figure out before you do the rest of your work, whether you should even do this at all, because whether you, this is even a feasible product, right? <laughs> yep. Um, in my experience, that's a rare case. It's an exciting case. I'm super thrilled for you that you had a case of that. <laughs> and it's awesome when it happens. Gives you a couple of gray hairs too. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it's not the most common situation that the feasibility risk is the biggest risk. Um, and so that's why my my answer may have not been as clear because it depends really on whether it's that. The other risks, um, and Marty Kagan talks about this, there's um, the value uh, value risk, there's the viability risk, and there's the usability risk. Um, and so mm -hmm. when we do pre-mortem risk analyses, we ask people to, we, we typically get the whole team together, including designers and other people, and we do all of those risks at once. And then we elevate from there to see what is the biggest kind of risk and what are the biggest risks. And so then I guess the thing is, is that if there's big feasibility ris risks, you're going to go one way where your engineers are going to start on the high risk, the high feasibility risk things. If there are not big feasibility risks, then your engineers should start on the things that have low other risks. So low value risk, low usability risk, low viability risk, because those are the things that you know are, no matter what else you learn, most likely to be needed. Mm, got it. Okay. So if we if we know something's buildable and we've basically if if the question if we've already answered the questions about like does, does someone want this and need this and can we make it, uh, then we should go after whatever whatever appears to be most valuable and, and doable from there. That makes sense. Okay, I like that. Um, thank you, because that 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 is a question that I uh, beat my head against the wall on for <laughs> literally years. Oh no! <laughs> so, <laughs> well, somehow you came out on the right side of it. So <laughs> I, I I think I hope we did. I don't know. It's, it's you're never you're never quite sure, but yeah. we got through it one way or the other. So I appreciate you uh, putting that one to rest for me, mm -hmm. so my psychology can let go of it. Um, <laughs> That's so perfect. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, just riffing on that example, you know, we, we've been framing all of this sort of in a, well, not explicitly, but we've, we've implicitly been framing all of this in a, a software, a primarily software oriented tech company, yeah. right? particularly like a growth company, a growth startup or a, uh, you know, a well established tech company like a, like a Facebook or Google, Spotify, Netflix, whatever. How do you see, because you're, you're working with people in all sorts of spaces. Mm -hmm. How do you see this? Is this, is this, is everything we're talking about here, is it the same across those industries? Like, does this stuff translate perfectly to, say, hardware or to a company that would not historically have considered itself a tech company? Oh, boy. No, not exactly. <laughs> and I asked I ask that because a, a some segment of the, of the listeners of this pod, uh, of, the, of the show are in tech, but a, a yeah. whole other segment are people who their entry to this was more around like organizational design and, um, like a real impact focus, like how do we mm -hmm. build something in the world that solves like real world problems? Yeah, not an impact, not in the tech impact way, but like impact in the like solving an important problem way. Yeah. Um, and so they may not be in that situation that you and I are so familiar with. So that's why. Yeah, I'm, yeah, that's why I'm no, that's awesome. So, so the truth is, the reason why I said no is just because the the hurdles are different, but the principles are absolutely applicable in all cases. In fact, I had a conversation with someone recently about how they might um, help people apply this in nonprofit orgs for impact analysis. Oh, fascinating. So it absolutely, it does not have to be a software company. I myself have applied it for, I mean, I used it for the working with portfolio school, um, which is a school I've used it, um, in other venues. Uh, yeah. the thing that's really different is what, what hurdles you're going to face and how people around you are going to respond, um, you know, because of what they're used to and what they experience. Okay, so, so tell me about the last time you worked through this process in a non-tech context. What was that like? Well, I basically, I mean, the type, the so we would literally say we're starting a new initiative with a, an organization that's a non-tech organization. We would still do a pre-mortem risk analysis, but we might have some differences in what um, types of risk we're emphasizing that we want to be brainstorming around. And in many cases, I still will use the same words. I'll still use value risk, um, but you know, it's not about a software user. It's about whoever uses the the service. I'll still use um, usability risk, but it's about service usability or you know whatever other types of things they're running. And viability viability risk. I, I should stop to clarify. That's the one where it's like, hey, if we if we made this thing for the customers and it costs us this to do it, like, is it a viable business? 
Um, and so that still is as a viable operation, where, even if it's a nonprofit. And then feasibility is like operational as opposed to software. Um, okay. So those are kind of the, the shifts that I make if I'm doing this for a non-software um, organization or group. Um, but then those, the, the core principles there all still apply. So we'll still map out, Hey, what are, you know, if we are a year in the future and this has failed, what do we think has gone wrong? Everybody brainstorm what's gone wrong. Let's, let's map out how important these risks are. Then let's, um, let's figure out sort of what I would call, um, a dual track discovery and operations. So, or it might be okay. program development. It might be operations, but you know, it's that side of things, instead of it being about what your engineers are doing, it might be about, your program managers or your, um, you know, people on the ground who are, who are giving services. But then the research side is actually still the same. You're still, it's just that, you know, usability testing isn't with a, with a computer and somebody sitting at a desk, right? Like, um, but other than that, you're actually still doing that. And uh, at the end of the day, measuring or, or trying to understand the, the usability of um, like a nonprofit service or an education or a school, um, or a, like a sign up flow or an application flow was one of the things I did. So we did, um, what does the process look like for someone who's exploring whether they want to go to the school? How does a person in that process, um, experience, you know, the information they're getting along the way and the help they're getting towards the application and the, the, you know, sign up. Um, and you know, you can still do a lot of the same things. It's just that it's not all about the software. What is it that gets like if someone's bought into the idea, right? And they see the path, they're like, cool. What actually trips it up? Like when mm -hmm. they, they are going to go down this path, like what are the things that get in the way of this actually happening? Whether that's like political, if that's like psychological, like worldviews or just some underlying assumptions that they didn't even realize they had. But what, what trips someone up who wants to actually go down this path? Yeah, there's a couple key things. Um, the first thing that I see tripping people up is poorly done research, making either the practitioner themselves or the stakeholders think that research isn't worthwhile. Mm. Uh, that definitely makes it hard to sell that we should do more of it and more continuously. Um, and it's the, the challenge there is that if a company hasn't been doing a lot of research or they haven't been doing a lot of continuous research, the first couple of rounds of research they do, if they don't have a coach helping them, it's probably going to be poorly done. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. First time you do anything, you know, most people aren't good at things the first time they do them. Exactly. And you don't exactly know why you're not good at it or you don't know what's wrong about what you did or where you went, you know, where you made a wrong call. But the way that you learn that is uh, if you don't have a coach helping you with it or some kind of guide is by going through the whole motion of then shipping the thing and seeing whether customers did what you thought they did with it. And if you, mm -hmm. you know, if they don't do what you expected, then guess what? Your research was not high quality in some form or another, um, which is normal when you're first starting, but then you have to assess why and figure that out and, you know, do retrospectives on it and then get better at how you do the research in the first place. Um, and that's, that's a whole, uh, that's a whole avenue. Um, mm -hmm. the, okay. another common, uh, challenge to this is structural and organizational. So basically, okay. you know, if the people who are listening are in a position to make changes to the organizational design and the way that things are managed, then great, you can start making these changes and then you're going to, um, you need to do it slow and then communicate with people and all these change management things, but you can do it. But a lot of times the person who's looking to make these changes doesn't have enough authority to change some things. So some of the, some of the areas, for example, that people will often have trouble is around budgeting, like annual budgeting mm -hmm. and the way that a company manages their investment in different projects. Um, if your company invests in projects on an annual basis based on some, you know, crappy uh, guess at what's going to happen with that thing that you might build in a year, then you're going to hit some more trouble with trying to, to transition to this. And, and then you have to spend more time on the stakeholder management and the understanding of how do we do this. And you also have to do a certain amount of, of projecting anyways, you know, just saying, well, I know that I don't know enough and this is going to get more clear, but here's some back of the envelope estimations just so that this can be compared with other things, apples to apples. I'm finding myself in a situation right now um, where I'm being asked to lead an effort to come up with a product, mm. but I'm not being presented the problem. It's like, hey, we want you to build us this kind of system. Mm. And so there's some little red flags going off in my brain. Like, wait a minute, like, mm -hmm. is this validated? Is this the right thing to build, etc. So I'm curious about when you have someone like, well, it, let's just take me as an example, but I'm sure this is a common case you run into. Yeah. How would you, how do you coach someone or advise someone to deal with it where they are being presented with 
build us an X as opposed to solve this problem? And mm -hmm. like, how do you, what, what should, what should I do about this basically? Yeah. They're using me as a proxy for many other people. Yeah, absolutely. So super common problem, right? And not, not what we wish we were facing as product managers, but something that we face often. Um, the, the key thing that I typically do is say, look, we can put this in, in multiple streams at once. So one stream is going to be, um, let's assume for this, for this side of our brain that we, think that they validated it and we are just going to go forward. What would we do? Um, what would that look like? Start mapping that out. Start thinking about... So we just went right into delivery. What would we do? Exactly. What would we do if we were going to do that, right? Um, and then the other stream is going to be, no, actually, when we put our whole brain together, we're like, what? Why are you telling us we should just build X? Um, so what would we do if we were given a green field and allowed to explore? Um, and... Basically, what we want to do is like we'll do the pre-mortem risk analysis on the product we were asked to build, but then it's going to come up with risks that'll make us think about areas that we want to explore in general. We'll do discovery interviews, um, trying to see if the product we were asked to build solves problems. And the way that we'll go about that is typically like, well, have people used anything like this in the past? When did they typically use it? What problems were they, you know, what led them to use it? Why did they switch to that, et cetera? Um, and then start to get a sense of what problems there are that this thing could solve. And then sometimes you'll get to a place where you're like, okay, it wasn't very clear strategy. Wish they'd given me more, but, you know, there's something here I can do and I need to nudge it in the right direction. Um, that's the most common case, to be honest. Um, it's less common that you get to that and you're like, okay, actually, this is just totally a non starter. We should kill it. Um, mm -hmm. But that does happen too. Yeah, I would say in this case, like there's a there there, but I'm not sure where it is. Exactly. Yeah. So if there's a there there, but you're not sure where it is, what you really want to do is go back to the um, the two way door, one way door uh, concept. So okay. you want to say, okay, if I'm not sure where the there there is, um, then what are the things I think it might be? And of those things, are there elements of this that we would need to build for all of them? If there are, great. That's not so risky. Start building that piece while you do the bigger picture research. Um, mm. If there are, are no elements like that, then, well, are there elements? Is there anything where there's like a two, two, these two versus those two decision? If there is, then maybe you can just ask the questions that answer that. Basically, you've got, if you're given something where they say build X and you think there's a there there, but you're not quite sure what it is, you probably have a ton of decisions to make and not enough information about them. So what you need to focus on is prioritizing which decisions to make one. So, so last question on this topic, then we'll start to, we'll start to wrap up mm -hmm. uh, and, and shift to some rapid fire questions. But I started thinking about this in the context of research, but I could see it applying more broadly. How should someone listening to this, how would you advise them to decide what feedback to pay attention to and listen to and what feedback to set aside? Mm, feedback that they're getting from, the, from anything. Yeah, so it could be it could be user feedback in your research, or it right. could be also like you know, hey, you had a one on one with your boss, and they gave you this feedback, yeah. or your your boyfriend gave you this feedback, or whatever. Mm -hmm. How how do you think is there is there a way that you would advise people to to step through deciding when to listen to feedback and take it on versus yeah. set it aside? Yeah, I mean to be honest, <laughs> um, this actually applies to go, going back to the beginning when I was talking about like uh, teaching my kids to understand authority but not to respect it blindly. Um, you can't just respond to every feedback piece you get or every piece of information you get just because somebody gave it to you. You have to um, figure out which ones are worth it. And the, the biggest way that I go about doing that is to start by saying, well, what is the source? Um, mm -hmm. Is If we're talking about customer feedback, which customer said it? And is that customer representative of a body of users that I want to be increasing satisfaction for? So, you know, tie it back to your company strategy. Tie it back to right now we're working on this segment of users. Was that customer from that segment? Okay, great. Let me think about what they said. Was that customer not from that segment? Well, then let me put it down over here in a place where I say we should know that we've got these potential problems with this other segment, but they're not part of our strategy, so we're going to let it go. Mm -hmm. Um then if the customer is part of the segment that you're focusing on for your strategy, then the next question becomes, what is the basis of the feedback? Is it, you know, did they literally just use something and tell you what their experience was? Did they tell you how they felt about something? That's a new level up above, you know, what it was just to use it itself. Did they tell you 
that they can't do something? Is it a blocker or did they tell you that they're frustrated by something or are they just telling you, I think it would be great if you did X, Y, Z. Um, so you really want to take that in stride. And, and I think the, the key element that I typically apply there is my understanding of how humans understand their own behavior. If the customer is giving me feedback based on something they've done recently in their own past, I'm going to take it as more important um, than if they're giving me feedback and they're telling it to me based on what they think they want in their future. And that's just because mm-hmm. humans aren't as good at predicting their future. Um, so if they tell it to me that way, I will ask them to tell me about their recent experiences that affected that or why they think that and try to get to that place. And if they can't articulate that well, then I'm going to put that in the bucket of, well, this feedback is probably something that it's good for us to be aware of, but we're not going to act on it right now. I love that you went, made that clear. It reminds me a little bit of a, there's a book that I, an, a former, an earlier guest on the show, uh, Christina Woodkey recommended. Uh, there's a book she call, uh, referenced that she referenced called Thanks for the Feedback mm-hmm. that I've been meaning to to read that I, I think is about this exact question. So it just kind of came back to mind as perhaps something, a good resource on this on this topic. Awesome. Well, if you do read that book, let me know because I haven't read it yet. So I'll, I'll take your cliff notes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Perfect. I, I, do, I do love uh, Christina Woodkey. So, you know, if she recommended it, I'm sure it's good. Yeah, Christina's great. Um, we're going to shift into the sort of the last segment of the conversation here uh, with some rapid fire questions. Um, Again, these are short, but your answers don't have to be riff however however yeah, you please. So uh, the first one is, what are, you, what are you either currently or recently have you read, watched, listened to that really impacted you or just stood out to you? Honestly, um, I've been listening to a lot of music and I, because I've been going through some changes in my life and I've needed it to help, uh, it's helped me stay upbeat. Yeah. Uh, there's a song called, fight song i think it's by rachel platten um okay and that's really impacted me it's like my anthem for right now um right on yeah is it like you, you get up in the morning you, pl- you blast that song and it's like you get up and go thing? i mean i wish but no i can't blast music with my kids but if my kids aren't here then yes right. <laughs> <laughs> You're like yeah i put the headphones on or i just jam out for five yeah minutes. no it's it's more like the song i play as soon as the kids are away <laughs> <laughs> You're like, all right, let's do this. Yes. And then I'm like, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love it. There's a similar, uh, and I'll, I'll share some of my, my answers to these questions as well as we mm, go. But yeah. there's a song that right before quarantine started, I was at the gym and they played this song by, I think I'm going to say, I'm going to butcher this name of the artist, but I think it's Dua Lipa. It's called Physical. Oh. And it is just the most like upbeat jam that uh, if I'm having like a day or whatever, that song just gets me like, I'm like, okay, let's do this. Nice. Let's go. It's like, a, it's like my current pump up song. All right. I'll add so, it to my list. Yeah. And we'll put the, we'll put all this stuff in the show notes too for the, for the listener. So definitely check it out. Um, cool. So what is it, if you think about recent memory and that could be, you know, that could be the last week, it could be the last two years, just wherever it fits for you. But what is a small change that you've made that has had an outsized impact in your, your life or your work, but just small change, big impact? Huh. Getting outside. I think uh, it's something that I didn't put as much stock into. You know, people always say it's really good to get outside, but you kind of think it's one of those things. You're like, oh, yeah, sure. It's good to get outside. Like, it's good to, you know, take your vitamins. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But I feel so much better when I get some fresh air every day. Um, And so I feel like just getting out for a walk, you know, um, even if uh, like right now, it's like it might just be a walk to the grocery store to buy groceries. But I think that's really has a big impact because it affects my mood and in the days when I haven't been doing it. And also just exercise in general, like I've been doing more exercise. Well, I was doing more exercise before quarantine. And it has a really big impact. Yeah, for sure. Uh, t- so I guess one bit of context in case anyone's listening to this in the far future, we're recording this in April 2020 during the global pandemic of COVID-19. So when we're referring to quarantine, that's what we're talking about. Everyone's basically supposed to stay home right now. So that's what we mean. Mm-hmm. Um, one, one, actually one resource I'll recommend that has been, um, I guess my answer to this question, but specifically during quarantine, the, the episode that actually just came out on Tuesday is with an awesome guy named Derek Mills, who's the founder of a company called Glow, mm-hmm. uh, which is a, it's my favorite of all of the, uh, like yoga apps out there. There are many, uh, but I love this one, which mm-hmm. I did not think I was going to say. Um, but that doing that, I've just found is even a few minutes every morning has made such a difference in my, 
just how my day goes. And it's something I could do like even 10 minutes in the morning at home. I don't have to go anywhere. And it's been great. So shout out to that. Definitely something to, uh, to try if you haven't. Cool. I'll check it out. Yeah, for sure. Especially, it definitely helps with the sanity when it's hard to go outside. Yeah. Uh, or we're not supposed to go anywhere. You know, all of us product manager types, we, we love us some lists. We love us some mental models. We love us some frameworks. Are there any um, mental models that you, you find to be extremely useful and that you lean on a lot? Yes. I wish that I, I because I, I'm still getting used to the role of being a teacher. I mean, I love teaching, but um, I wish that I could turn and be like, oh, it's so-and-so's mental model. I love it. It's great. Here's what it is. Because I just like giving shout outs to other people. Um, sure. But honestly, the thing that comes to mind that I use the most is one of my own. Um, I call it the Oomph framework. And I use it for doing an assessment of, of a product opportunity. Um, Oomph is U-M-P-F. And basically, it's a it's a really lightweight assessment um, when you're trying to decide between different opportunities for for improving a product. So for example, I recently used it with a client who is like, okay, we've got phase one out. We've got, you know, we've shipped um, all these units. We've got all these users. We want to figure out what's going to give us the biggest growth for the next phase. And so we did this. We say, okay, you is for users. Um, and we always start with the user because you've got to be in the mindset of the user. And and I, I'm really adamant about that because even though you could technically do these things in any order, I always want people to do user first because that makes them less likely to get confused about what a user will really do. Um, whereas if you start with like the business model side, it's easy to be like, well, and then users will do this because it'll make my business work. And you're like, yeah, except they won't Ta-da. do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we start with the user and we map out who, which users this is for and what their characteristics are like, um, what kind of pains they have and what desired outcomes they're going for. And then we go for M market. And that's really the place where we're scaling up from qualitative to quantitative and saying how many people are like that user, what kind of data points might we have that will help us when we're comparing this against other assessments? Um, how do we know the size of, of the unmet need in the market? Um, mm-hmm. Then we do P. And in this case, that's um, product. And so basically, that's a place where usually at this point in time, my clients will already have some ideas of what they might be doing in these different directions. And so like, just describe it. What does it look like? What would it mean to do it? You know, What criteria do you have around it? And then um, ideally described in terms of what outcomes it drives for your customer more than what um, features it involves. But there might be some things where you're like, oh, I know I'd need to build a system to support X and we don't have that system today. And then the last one, F is feasibility. And so that's basically this idea, you know, going back to earlier, like how big is the feasibility risk? And if the feasibility is well understood, how what is the general size of it? And all of these are meant to be more back of an envelope type of um, assessment, not, you know, not rigorous scientific assessment. Um, and then you do that for a couple of opportunities at a time, or maybe maybe three or five even. Um, and that way you have just this really basic framework that's really easy to do and lightweight that you can use to help you kind of assess, okay, of these different opportunities, I think we better start researching this one or these two. I love that. I love that. I'm totally going to start using that. Yay. One thing I've noticed just from my own experience uh, and, you know, outing myself here and, and many people that I've worked with or met in in our general field is a lot of, uh, I'd say a lot of us are recovering perfectionists yeah. and uh, have, have long grappled <laughs> yes. with, uh, it, it, yeah, have long grappled with imposter syndrome, which is, I think, a rampant psychological phenomenon. And whether you identify or whether you personally resonate with that or not, I'm curious, um, what, if you have any advice for people who who resonate with that, what they can do uh, to to deal with that and move forward in, in a healthy way? Oh my goodness, yes, I have lots of experience with that. Um, but it doesn't bother me anywhere near what it did ten years ago. And I think it's exposure therapy. <laughs> mm, <okay. laughs> like for me, it's practicing not being perfect and being okay with it. It's practicing feeling like an imposter and being okay with it. It's really practicing being in that deliberate practice where you're uncomfortable, but you keep going. And then one day you look back and you're like, I'm not uncomfortable anymore. Huh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right on. Now, that re- it reminds me of a, an exercise that a friend gave me once um, that was, uh, he called it like a 30 day of 30, 30 days of discomfort challenge or something, mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. And basically it was to take this on and every day you had to do something that made you, I, I had to do something that made me uncomfortable. Yeah. It could be anything and like anything, it could be tiny, it could be big, didn't matter. But the, the key bit I, in reflecting on it was, um, before I did the thing, I had to write down what I was afraid of. Mm-hmm. And then after I did the thing, I had to write down what actually happened. Mm. And over a month of doing that, you know, it becomes very obvious how much 
almost none of it. None of the bad things I was afraid of happened. Yeah. Like none. That's awesome. I think literally none. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that as well. Like do the thing that you're scared of. Um, you yeah. know, like continually be like, well, what am I scared of? Well, why am I scared of that? Let me go do that. Um, and uh, I, I had listened to a podcast um, sometime in the fall where someone was saying that she did that every day for a year and Whoa. that it was just like the most amazing year. Like by the end of it, she's just a completely changed person. And I thought to myself, like, I get that. That makes sense to me. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do things that I'm scared of. And it's, it goes back to that feeling of flying. Like you do, if you do things you're scared of regularly and you're like, well, why am I scared of this? How bad would that be? You know, like it, you start to, that's what the exposure is the exposure to the failure or the, or the exposure to the, what, what, what actually is the outcome that, you know, maybe isn't even what you were scared of. And the more of that you get, the more you're, you kind of toughen up your skin and you're like, oh yeah, no, you know what? I'm not perfect and that's okay. You know, um, and the way I'm going to grow is I'm going to be just able to try things that I fail at and be okay when I fail. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think that's, that's sort of the perfect place to wrap up this, this, what I hope is a, a first conversation. I, we've come full circle back to, you know, the ability to be in the discomfort, which I think is a, a through line of all of this and makes a real difference. So before we, before we wrap up, Holly, is there uh, any, any asks you have of the audience? Uh, what would you, if you have any, any requests of the listener, what would you ask them? Oh, well, I feel like I should just go with that theme of ask them to make themselves uncomfortable <laughs> 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 and to think about, you know, what, what in their lives they're not doing just because they're scared and, but they, it's something that they're thinking about doing and, you know, why, why are they letting the fear get, get in the way? What would be the worst that would happen? And could they, you know, work towards that even with small steps? Yeah. I mean, related to that, um, I, you know, one of the things that I do is I coach. Um, I used to coach skating and, um, and I've also done, you know, basically every time that I got my skill to a level where I was good enough to teach others, I was like, I'm going to help others with this. Um, uh -huh. and so, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in chatting about it, especially if you are listening to this anytime near when we've recorded it, um, you know, currently, uh, during the quarantine, everyone's like, I just want to talk to people. So, um, I'm totally open for some conversations if anyone wants to, to, um, to chat with me and, uh, I would be honored to hear what people are scared of and help them overcome it. Oh, I love that. That's so generous of you. Thank you. And, and if people listening want to uh, reach out, get in touch with you, where can people find you online and your work and if they want to engage with you? Yeah. So um, my website is h2rproductscience.com and my Twitter handle, which is the social media I'm on the most is h2rproductsci. It ends in S-C-I um, because that was as long as it could be. <laughs> and then uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn as well. And you can email me at holly at h2rproductscience.com and I will definitely respond. And um, if, uh, you know, if you want to actually chat, you can find a link to, to just book a session, uh, book a free chat with me in the contact page of my website, I think. So I'm happy to just talk with people. At this point in time, I'm really interested in just getting to know where people are at in their personal, you know, product management journeys or, um, or other sort of, uh, you know, journeys to being badasses. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So if you're listening to this and this is all interesting to you and you think you could, uh, you want to learn more, definitely reach out to Holly. She's an amazing resource on all of this, as you can no doubt tell by this conversation. So Holly, thank you so much for taking some time and, and hanging out with me. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Andrew. It has been a real pleasure. Totally the, you know, the fantastic experience I was hoping it would be. So thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on iTunes. That helps us reach way more people and build this community up. For show notes, links to the resources, and everything else we discussed, please go to enliven.fm. Feel free to reach out with questions, feedback, or just to say hello by emailing connect at enliven.fm. Be sure to subscribe, and until next time, my friends, leave them better than you found them. We'll see you soon.